Hello everyone, how's it going? Today I wanted to give a quick lecture, uh, continuing our discussion from the past couple of videos, and talk about the pressure volume relationships within the heart uh, throughout the cardiac cycle. In this figure to the left, we could see the relationship between end diastolic volume and therefore cardiac muscle fiber length on ventricular pressure. And we talked about in the last videos how basically diastole is this period of passive uh, tension development. And so as the ventricles fill up with blood during diastole, they're very compliant. They're able to take on these quantities of blood without, you know, huge increases in ventricular pressure. Um, until you see at a certain point that curve does start to get bigger. But it should be noted that this is really uh, only seen, this portion of the curve is really only seen in isolated hearts when you actually remove uh, the heart from an organism. And then you're able, uh, as you fill up those ventricles of blood, you can see um, that you know pressure does start to increase a little bit more dramatically. However, in a healthy human uh, heart with an intact pericardium, the pericardium is going to prevent the overfilling. And so uh, those sarcomeres are not going to get beyond 2.2 microliters. Um, and then basically, you know, we're going to have uh, this compliant relationship uh, and not much developed pressure, pressure as the ventricles fill up with blood. However, uh, systole, we know is, this is the active period, right, where our cardiac muscles are going to become activated and contract. And that's going to, you know, look at in this curve, this is going to show a less compliant curve. And then we're going to see steep increases um, in pressure at low volumes because those cardiac muscle fibers are going to, you know, again, contribute to uh, ventricular pressure. Uh, we see that, you know, the human heart again is going to operate on the steep portion of the curve. Um, you know, those, those ventricles are going to uh, fill up with blood. And as that preload increases, uh, so does the peak force that is developed by cardiac myocytes and then therefore pressures inside. And again, in an intact human heart, um, you know, physiologically, we're not going to see this descending portion of the curve here because, again, the anatomy, the pericardium prevents that overfilling and allows for high uh, peak pressures in order to eject out blood. So combining our last two lectures, we're really going to talk about now the phases of the heart and the relationship between volume and pressure throughout the cardiac cycle. And so, you know, depicted here is basically that volume pressure relationship throughout one entire cycle. So um, in the graph, uh, we're going to start on this point right here, A, and this is going to be the start of diastolic filling. Uh, so from A to C is going to be that period where the ventricles fill up with blood. And then right here at point C is when that mitral valve closes. And then we're going to start that period of systole. Uh, from C to D is our isovolumetric contraction. So all of the valves are closed, but pressure is developing within the ventricles. Remember, no blood is moving. So that volume, uh, this point here on the x-axis is going to stay the same as pressure starts to increase. Then at point D right here, that's when the aortic valve opens and blood is going to be ejected from that left ventricle out to the aorta. And then you will get a little bit of a reduction, a little bit of a uh, drop in pressure. Then that aortic valve will close. And then what's going to happen is the, the uh, cardiac myocytes surrounding the ventricles are going to relax. And that's called isovolumetric relaxation. So we're going to get a huge drop in pressure uh, after ejection. So then uh, once the cycle starts all over again, we have low pressure, so then those ventricles can fill back up with blood. And this is the cycle and the relationship between volume and pressure throughout the cardiac cycle. Like we discussed in previous videos, ultimately preload and afterload can impact our stroke volume. Uh, preload is going to impact 
of course, the length of our sarcomeres and then therefore the pressure. And so um, at this point C right here, if we get an increase in venous return, uh, we're going to get a higher end diastolic volume and therefore we're going to get a higher preload of that left ventricle. And so, you know, we're going to get higher forces uh, that could be developed by the sarcomeres when they are active. And we could see that at low end diastolic volumes, uh, you know, there's a greater relative increase uh, in systole, you know, based on the steepness of this curve. So a little bit of an increase um, in end diastolic volume is going to produce a much larger um, increase in systolic pressure than near the uh, top of the curve where it's a little bit less affected by these volumes um, up near the peak. Uh, afterload also is going to impact the pressures and volumes of the cardiac uh, volume pressure relationship here. And so, so remember that afterload is going to be impacted by aortic pressure or systemic pressure. And once that aortic valve opens, a higher afterload is going to reduce the velocity of that left ventricular contraction. And then therefore... Uh, is going to impact our stroke volume. And so what you're going to see is that with a higher afterload, with a higher systemic pressure, um, and if the heart is producing the same exact uh, force and tension on the contraction, that there is going to be a lower stroke volume, that less blood is ejected from the left ventricle, and then there's going to be more blood left over otherwise known as N systolic volume. So ultimately preload and afterload are going to impact this pressure volume relationship and are going to impact stroke volume and cardiac output. And you know, we'll talk more in the future about how preload and afterload are altered. Um, they are impacted both by uh, cardiac output and other vascular factors. Uh, but for now, uh, just remember that preload you know, is going to impact the stroke volume and, and uh, by, you know, impacting uh, sarcomere length and then therefore pressure that could be developed. And then afterload is going to impact uh, that velocity of contraction and a higher afterload is going to reduce stroke volume. Not only do preload and afterload impact uh, stroke volume, but also as we talked about contractility, the strength of contraction of these cardiac myocytes. And so, you know, this curve A here, this solid line, that's going to be, I guess, our like control heart, our normal healthy heart. And then if we have anything with a positive inotropic effect, uh, what's gonna happen is contractility is going to increase. And so we're going to see higher pressures uh, generated from that left ventricle. And if we have a negative inotropic effect, that is going to decrease contractility and we're going to see reduced uh, pressures that are developed. So positive inotropic effect, increased pressure, and then therefore increased stroke volume, and then negative inotropic, decreased pressure, decrease in stroke volume. But not only that, the rate of pressure development is going to change with positive and negative inotropic effects. And so we can look at that by looking at the slope of these curves. And so, you know, when you have this positive inotropic effect that is going to increase the rate of pressure development, uh, while in for negative inotropic effects, that will, that will lengthen the amount of time that pressure is developed. So not only is overall uh, pressure different with changes in contractility, but the rate of pressure development is also changing. So what we're gonna see the highest slope, the maximal slope is going to be uh, for all hearts during that isovolumic, isovolumetric contraction, right? This is when we're going to get uh, the steepest increase in pressure over time. Now, there are other measures of contractility as well, um, a aortic flow, right? So the amount of blood that's actually entering and passing through the aorta, um, which is shown in another figure in your textbook. And so ejection fraction is also going to determine how well or how strong the heart is contracting. 
and that's going to be stroke volume, the amount of blood that is ejected from the left ventricle, over the starting amount of blood in the left ventricle, the end diastolic volume. And so now in a normal heart, that ejection fraction should be somewhere around 55 to 70 percent. Uh, with mild heart failure, uh, that's going to be, you know, 40 to 54 uh, percent. Um, some people may not even know that this is occurring. Uh, mild heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, uh, you're going to have a ejection fraction of 35 to 39 percent. And then moderate to severe um, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is going to be under uh, 35 percent. And so these are variables that we use to uh, determine the contractility of the cardiac muscle and to see uh, the ability of the heart to eject out blood from the left ventricle. Just going back to these points here and giving some elaboration. So a hyperdynamic heart, what we're going to see is a reduced end diastolic volume, rapid increase in left ventricular pressure and short ejection phase. So why is that and what does that mean? A reduced end diastolic volume because we are ejecting more blood out of the left ventricle. So now when the heart fills on the next beat, there is going to be less preload. There's going to be less end diastolic volume if everything else is the same because that hyperdynamic heart, that positive inotropic effect, led to an increase in what was ejected out of the heart uh, consequently affecting the next beat. And again, uh, we'll talk more about this in future chapters, how, you know, sort of the heart has to adjust beat to beat uh, with everything going on. In addition, like we said, looking at the slope, there is a rapid increase in left ventricular pressure uh, because this contractility is increased. So, you know, uh, more tension and more force is being developed. Therefore, more pressure is being developed quicker. And then that's going to equal a short ejection phase as well because, you know, we're going to be able to eject out a lot of blood in a shorter period of time. And then we have the opposite, um, for the most part, in, for negative inotropic effects, a hypodynamic heart, uh, where we're going to get a larger preload because the heart is not ejecting out as much blood. Therefore, on the, you know, subsequent next beat, we're going to have more that's left over in the left ventricle, therefore a larger end diastolic volume and a, a larger preload. So again, it's sort of beat by beat. Uh, there's adjustments going on. So one beat will affect the next beat. Uh, a slower increase in left ventricular pressure as depicted by uh, the, the, the slope here. And then also a reduced ejection, right? We're getting less blood ejected from the left ventricle. So that's it uh, for this video. I just wanted to make a quick one again, sort of elaborating a little bit more on those relationships between volume and pressure throughout the cardiac cycle. Um, you know, again, sort of elaborating more on ejection fraction and contractility and the effects of preload and afterload on that volume and pressure relationship. Thank you guys so much and I'll see you in the next video.